speak about this climate club concept that has come from Germany. So let me just get started with that and turn to Madam Vaiseka Aisha Khan. Um, Madam, do you see uh, climate pricing, climate ta uh, carbon taxation as, as a tool in our arsenal of weapons uh, against climate change? Or do you see it as a diversionary, distractionary tactic? Thank you, Ulka. Good evening, everyone. Uh, you know, speak my mind. Actually, coming from Bangladesh, you all know how vulnerable we are. The Global Climate Risk Index uh, puts Bangladesh in the seventh position among most vulnerable countries. But we contribute so little of the global emission. With, you know, it's probably per capita 0.98 ton CO2 emission and uh, less than 0.47% of global emissions. Now, if we are talking about what do we, what does Bangladesh re need right now? And what do countries like Bangladesh need right now? We need funds to mitigate the effects of climate change. We need funds for adaptation, both. And we need funds. When we're talking about funds, what about the loss and damages? And it's weird talking about human beings. I have seen, I'm, I'm from the coastal area of Bangladesh. I'm from Chittagong. Mm -hmm. And uh, the home that I grew up in, the home that my father grew up in, the home that my grandfather grew up in, in it's in the middle of the city, in the middle of Chittagong city. Now at high tide, it's, it's, the water comes into the courtyard. That is due to climate change. It is due to climate effect. And when it is happening to uh, coastal belts who are more vulnerable. And I have seen newly built schools being washed away. And people's lives are, you know, changed overnight. People are uprooted. And they are, their life, you know, their uh, lifestyle changes. They are, they are becoming poorer. So now if, now if we talk about taxing those poor people, how does that work? That doesn't, that I, to me it doesn't make any sense. I have, you know, I've been, uh, I've worked with finances, I've worked in banks, and I understand the money aspect. But why tax, why, what is the reason for talking about uh, carbon taxation in the same breath as loss and damage or adaptation plan or mitigation. Carbon taxation uh, for poorer countries, for climate vulnerable countries, is not the right approach for this moment. I will leave this at now, and maybe we can talk about it more later. Thank you very much. Mrs. Inha, I'll turn to you. I mean, Madam said very clearly, we need funds. Do you see the carbon cl uh, climate club concept as a way of bringing in these much needed funds? Madam Khan is right. Climate change is a planetary emergency. But trying to tackle it with just carbon pricing or a carbon border adjustment mechanism as the EU is proposing, I wouldn't say is a well-considered and well-advised uh, proposal. I think we need to approach it very differently. And just like after World War II, Two, to secure the peace, we set up the Bretton Woods institutions. In the same way, we need to set up a range of new institutions to secure the climate as well. And unless these institutional arrangements and the global north and the global south fully cooperate, we are not going to make much headway on this planetary emergency. Uh, and this has to be an inclusive process. And um, uh, rather than the EU just moving forward uh, with its own ideas and proposals, uh, I think it's necessary 
that we come up with uh, something that is stronger and better than the Paris Agreement, uh, which is an inclusive climate club where there are benefits to being in the climate club in terms of uh, fiscal transfers from the global north to the global south so that we can deal with both mitigation and adaptation issues. And at the same time, we deal with, as Professor Nordhaus has pointed out, nor, uh, the free rider problem associated with people uh, not complying uh, with uh, agreements uh, to reduce uh, carbon emissions. So we need a much better framework. We need a much more inclusive, uh, but also a much more attractive climate club with the right incentive structure. Because as we all know, you get what you pay for, right? So if you're not going to pay for it, you're not going to get it. It's as simple as that. So we have to create the right incentive structures for the global north and the global south working together cooperatively to deal with the planetary emergency. If we just try and do it in, in a unilateral, uh, ill-considered manner, uh, I don't think we'll make traction. And I don't think you know our children and our grandchildren are going to forgive us for that because we have an opportunity over the next decade or two to bend the curve. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't take the necessary actions in the next few years, uh, we are headed towards 3.2 degrees centigrade. And all of you know that that's not a very attractive world uh, to live in. Uh, we are seeing already in Delhi what, you know, 43 degree temperature means uh, in April. So it's just only going to get worse from here. But as I said, just a simplistic approach towards uh, just either carbon pricing or a carbon border tax uh, is, is not sufficient. We need a much more comprehensive and inclusive approach. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to you, Kiran, next to explain a little bit to us about some of the terms that Mr. Sinha has been using. But before that, I want to do a little bit of a spot poll. All those in favor of carbon tax who think a carbon price mechanism or a carbon tax globally or domestically is a good idea, please put up your hands. Let's just have a show of hands. Very uncommitted hand. <laughs> One, two, three, four. They want to jump Five. Them. Yes. No, no, no. No consequences. And those against, those opposed. You're putting up your hand for both? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> we should have her speak. Yes. <laughs> on the one hand, on the other hand, are you an economist? <laughs> Great. So let's say, Kira, if you can change their minds, tell us a little bit more about what the EU is proposing. Yes. So, um, well, first of all, um, very well taken your points, um, and um, I think we can all agree that um, the situation we are now in with the climate crisis as it is today is due to the emissions of industrialized countries. Um, and the solution to this lies in um, decarbonizing in industries, and for this, the most efficient way is a price on carbon. But, of course, uh, this price should not be paid by the poorest of people. Um, I think this, this is an important, important uh, thing to think about. Um, and the other part is that um, we, uh, in Germany, uh, the government does not want to start trade wars now um, uh, over the climate crisis. This is not their, their intention. Um, because there has been a lot of talk about um, how a CBAM, a carbon uh, border adjustment mechanism, would look like or how the climate club would, would look like. So I think climate club is also slightly misleading because it's supposed to be an open and cooperative um, um, institution. Um, so it's more like an alliance. Um, and the, um, the word on both the CBAM and the climate club is not out yet. So these are still things that are being designed uh, and negotiated um, with, uh, within Germany itself, so within different ministries, what they are going to propose. And then it will be taken um, to a variety of partners, and then it will be negotiated who wants to join this type of setup or a different one. So um, just, just to, to make it clear that uh, the proposals that exist are not yet finalized. So for the Climate Club, the idea is um, to have um, uh, an alliance of states that are more ambitious than um, the international um, community as a whole. Because what we are seeing in the, uh, in the COPs um, is a progress um, that is a little bit sloth-like, so very slow. 
Um, so uh, we have seen progress with the Paris Agreement, but on the implementation of Paris, we're still lagging far behind what is really necessary to, um, to limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees. So what I can tell you from um, the proposals that I have seen so far is that um, what is being talked about is uh, a, a minimum carbon price um, for members who want to join the club, but there's also exemptions for uh, countries which would not be able to pay this carbon uh, pricing, so there would be exemptions and there would also be transitional phases. Um, but there would be a general commitment to want uh, to adhere to ambitious um, climate protection measures. Um, there's also some more technical issues. So, for example, things that have not been covered by the COP, like um, sea and air traffic, um, that this would be addressed within the club, um, and that there would be um, cooperation on climate finance, uh, technological uh, cooperation, and capacity building. Um, so maybe um, this this on the climate club, um, on the carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, um, the, the proposal um, has been out um, from the EU Commission. Um, it will be um, taken to EU Parliament to um, draft actually legal text um, and also by, by EU member states. So this is a process that will take several years um, and the full proposal is not supposed to be out until one or two years from now. Um, but the intention of this uh, proposal is basically uh, to avoid carbon leakage, so to avoid industries that are located within the European Union to have um, a competitive disadvantage um, from more polluting uh, industries, so that these companies would not leave Europe um, in order to avoid um, the carbon tax or carbon price. Um, so. Um, but again, there are um, a number of, um, of questions around this. Um, there, um, it's applicable to, um, to housing, uh, to energy, um, and to um, uh, tra uh, tra transport, uh, transit, um, and also to certain chemical uh, industries. Um, so um, just, to, uh, just to close my remarks, um, I think it's, it's crucial what you said, to, um, to basically um, not only talk about mitigation, but also to bring more adaptation questions into this. And I fully understand the frustration um, around uh, the broken promise of the 100 billion um, of climate finance. I also understand the loss and damage question. Um, and uh, we have seen in Germany how much it costs to rebuild areas after the flooding that we witnessed in our place uh, last year. Um, so I, I really understand this, but I also want to mention that Germany has contributed significant amounts to climate finance. Uh, we have in the last, uh, from 2015 to 2018, we have contributed um, 35 billion US dollars, which is more than three times than the US has. So there is a difference between different industrialized countries and their contributions to, um, to climate finance. And the US, this is also because of the, the blocking in the US Congress, um, so, so they are not able to move as, as quickly as we are. Uh, but I just want to make clear that um, also within this community of European states of industrialized nations, there are different scales of commitment. Thank you. I think your point at the end was very important, Kira, because the idea also is that this climate club or other such instruments should create a race to the top rather than a race to the bottom. We kind of spur each other on, so you create an ambition loop. Um, but I think what's also important is the point that she made that many of these are still at the proposal stage. They're still up for discussion. And with India taking over the G20 presidency later this year, there's actually an opportunity to put our uh, variant of these proposals. So after we hear from Elizabeth and Shirish, we'd actually like to hear from you uh, before we have any second round of comments about any, you know, what would you like to see? What are the questions? What are the, you know, skeptics amongst you feel about some of the things that you're hearing? But let me turn to Elizabeth and then Shirish about, you know, some of the cautionary notes that you heard the others strike. What would, what is your take on the potential distributional implications of such policies? Or how would you like to bring in more equity and inclusion into these? Sure. And, I, th th and thank you so much, Elka, for having me. And it's nice to be with all of my fellow panelists and the rest of you this evening. I think it's, it's very clear um, you know, what, uh, that, that wealthy nations have emitted far more than poor. And, and hopefully, 
Um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to peek soon and, and come down, but I think one of the things that we've been thinking about um, at the Rockefeller Foundation is really what, you know, what needs, what we need, what needs to happen um, and how, you know, our, our mission in particular is really thinking about how we can solve some of the most intractable problems in the world with science-based philanthropy and data. And our vision is to really ensure that we achieve opportunity for all. And so in so doing, um, I think for our, from our perspective, we felt very much um, coming out of this crisis of, of COVID that we needed to focus on ensuring that the most vulnerable people around the world had access to energy. Because our theory was that if we didn't really think about um, the most vulnerable people, they'd be left behind. And that if we also, if we didn't do, if we didn't think about clean and renewable energy, we would have, you know, a, a recovery effort really um, driven by fossil fuel, uh, greater fossil fuel curation. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we did was, is really focus on what do we need to do um, to drive a green and equitable recovery. And we're doing a number of things, but I think the most important and relevant thing in this conversation right now is, is our work um, around the Global Energy Alliance for People and Planet. And what we aim to do there um, is to ensure that we work with somewhere between 60 and 80 countries to ensure that we have prevented um, or diverted at least 4 billion tons of greenhouse gases, enabled a billion people to access clean and re reliable renewable energy, since over 2 billion people in the world don't have that right now, and to also ensure that we have 150 million green jobs that we've created, all of which the other piece of the equation that is so critically important that my colleague DePauli and I were talking about is making sure that women represent at least 50% of the productive use and 50% percent of the job opportunities um, that come out of this. And so in order to do that, um, we've committed about, um, I know our country, <laughs> as you're right, Kira, is, my country is a little bit behind in what we could do in climate. Uh, we have a long way to go and a lot more cooperation to be had. Um, but you know, we as philanthropy, uh, three of us came together and we've committed a billion and a half dollars to ensuring that we can drive in hopefully a hundred billion dollars of private and other government and philanthropic capital into this opportunity to ensure that we are enabled enabling people uh, to have a cleaner, greener um, life and an ability to actually access the modern economy uh, through economic opportunity. So that's the way that we're, you know, we're trying to, to do this. And I, I guess I'm kind of like the, the woman over there who was like, I kind of have my hand up, I kind of had my hand down on the carbon tax because I think if we can figure out a way, I mean, we've got 130 trillion in private sector commitments um, to this. And I think we have to find a creative way, um, as you said, to tap into that. Because I don't think absent that kind of commitment, we can actually achieve some of the technological advances and some of the project implementation and TA that needs to actually happen to address some of these climate challenges. And so um, I guess I'm half-half, but I think if we can figure out how to do it well, that we can implement a carbon, uh, a carbon market scheme, if you will, that is equitable and inclusive um, and does not penalize countries that have really not been the reason that we have the issues that we have, um, I would certainly be supportive of that and something that I th or, you know, we would really look to focus on figuring out how to do. Thank you, and you really, really put your finger on it when you compared the billions of dollars that philanthropy brings and the hundreds of trillions of dollars that are flowing through private investment. So clearly this is all about the third goal of the Paris Agreement, which is to green all of finance. Mm -hmm. But Shirish, let me point to you and ask you to take a skeptical look at what you've heard so far. Thanks, Ulka. No, I mean, you know, listening to all the fellow panelists, a um, couple of things have come very clearly. I think we all are agreeing that there is a need for, there is an urgency to act on climate, right? I think that's clearly established. What also becomes very clear is that that urgency to act cannot be done without role of climate justice. And I think that has to be at center and at the core of it. So the, you know, from our perspective as a foundation, when we are looking at, um, this is what we see right now. What, and what I basically would say is the ambition gap. So there are commitments from the countries all over the world uh, to take action on climate change. Um, but for these commitments to then become effective, they need to be translated into policies. Right? And, and then policies then, in many cases, and in most cases, I would, we would say, I would say that are not yet ready for either a 2030 scenario of what ambition needs to be 
and then forget 2050, because if you're not ready for 2030, which is your more immediate short-term actions, you're never going to reach right, that. Now, and though countries which have ambitions which are really on track for 2030, and, and I, I honestly feel some of the analysis, Ulka, you do a lot more analysis uh, regularly. If you look at what India did recently in the, the Glasgow, um, when the Prime Minister Modi announced, those targets are ambitious, right? And for an economy where we are and the way we are still growing, it's going to be a huge task for us to achieve it, but they're still very ambitious. And the third pillar of the gap is on the implementation, right? And so if you look at these three aspects, that the policies need to be get converted into implementation, and what we see is the ambition gap, what we see is the gap on the financing front. Mm -hmm. So unless we do not bridge or close this gap, we are not going to you know, raise the issue as the, as Madam said, you know, for vulnerable countries, whether it is in South Asia or the other African countries, they will get more and more exposed and more and more vulnerable, right? So I, th I think that closing that gap with, with solutions, with ambition, with technology, with policies, standards, all of that is essentially needed. Right? So I think that's, that's something which uh, is to be focused. So our view is that any international cooperation which helps to bridge that gap is going to make the huge difference, especially for those who are most impacted uh, by, by climate. Now what we see unfolding is that G7 is not increasing its ambition. It's also not increasing its financial commitments that it has made, it's not fulfilling them. G20 is not moving fast, it, it, it's, it, it's, it, and as, as you therefore start getting more, more, more and more complicated. So what we therefore need is a complementary platform, right? And I think if the conversations currently on the, the, the way the carbon club has to be defined or looked at is still up for discussion, I think the word that was used by was on alliance, right? And I think that really uh, gives it, makes it more inclusive because that will then ensure equity or climate justice then becoming central and core to the part of it. So I think that exactly what we need, that you know, we need to bring equity at the center as we start to bridging those gaps. So let me pause here, Ulkar. I think that's what I think we need to do. I think that the rationale for doing um, the, the work around any mechanism which leads to faster action is clear but unless we don't bridge the equity issue, and which will make it inclusive and represent the voices of the most impacted, um, they need to be there on the table. They need to be there on the table. Now, whether you do it through a uniform carbon price or a taxation, it's going to be impossible. It's a good, good from an economist perspective, you can have them, right? It, it, it's, it's, it, it really, good. but it's a political nightmare. It, it's very difficult to implement. So I think one has to see what is realistic. Hmm? And I think we should look at those solutions, hmm, what, what could make uh, a difference to, to happen. So let me pause here, and then pass it back to you. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, as you were speaking, so I'm an economist, I'm not defending economics <laughs> tools, but you know, we are, That's given where said. we are with the climate, yes, given where we are with climate change, I think we are discussing increasingly unrealistic tools, direct air capture, geoengineering. So I think we are sort of throwing everything at it. But let me, with this round of opening remarks, turn to the audience, turn to the participants. You've been hearing about geopolitics and the role of you know, environmental issues within that. Let me start with you, ma'am, because you raised your hand and both for and against. She'll never raise her hand. <laughs> 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 but please, uh, any que and uh, to all of you, please feel free to share your questions for the panelists, any comments that you have, but let's, let's start with you. So is it a question of why I raised my hands for both? <laughs> um, I agree with all of you and um, I mean I don't know as much as you people do and I'm really excited to be here just to be hearing um, I agree I agree that we need to have carbon tax but not on uh, poorer people or middle class people it has it has to be it, it is a must but it has to be implemented on the richer uh, corporates who are emitting huge amounts of carbon. So their carbon tax is a must, but not on a, not an everyday laborer or a worker. So that is why I raised my hands for both. Yeah. Uh, 
if that is i'm i'm not sure if that is part of the design uh, that what kira was saying and if that is part of the design then okay but the richest uh countries or the countries emitting the most will be uh, taxed that is what you're saying right yeah in a in a uh, i don't i mean that sounds about right mm. but will the system work like that because we have been sitting for climate funds for how many years now i mean <laughs> No, let's be realistic here. Yes, <laughs> yes. and see, I I chair the parliamentary committee on power, energy, mineral resources in Bangladesh, and Bangladesh being a very energy hungry economy because we are developing very fast, we took the decision to cancel the ins installation of ten coal based power plants only this July, okay, which would have uh, you know <laughs> no which. With that would have that means 12 billion US dollars of FDI mm. that we have let go. So that is bold. We need bold decisions. There is no time. There is there is no time to beat around the bush. And like you know, talking about uh, cli okay climate clubs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, that will take years. What are we going to do now? How do we look at our children and say that we are not trying to solve it? Like we passed this motion of planetary emergency in our parliament, I think, three years ago. Three or we were one of the first parliaments to pass the motion unanimously. But then COVID hit, right? So you see, COVID is we have managed to uh, overcome COVID. Now the war has hit. So we will have emergencies. Continue to, that is life. But does that mean that we, we don't try to solve the problems of our, you know, this is like climate, climate problems are like, it's about survival of the planet, not just people sitting here. It's about the planet. So we need to do something which works fast. That is my two bits. Thank you. Mr. Sina, would you like to weigh in on let's, this? Let's yeah? let's yes, please. Please, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm uh, Dominic Dixon, the Executive Director of UNADAP. I was uh, at the COP26, and um, just before Prime Minister Modi could go for his talk, I was beside uh, the Prime Minister, and I told him to be careful of uh, uh, the carbon usage in India. The West has done its own share of pollution, re-engineered, remarketed every, everything, right from the, you, you could even go down into the Industrial Revolution. And uh, like, you, you, like uh, the colleague beside me was talking about, you know, the injustice. Like, I mean, why should the poor pay a tax that's equivalent to um, someone who's, who has more pollution? Uh, if you go, on, go down to the Bitcoin, to mine one Bitcoin, it's about 680,000 hours of watching a YouTube. And it's about 530,000 credit card or plastic transactions. So who's gonna be monitoring uh, the consumption of Bitcoin? So we've been through 26 COP, uh, COP26s. Um, Alok Sharma wasn't too happy with the, the response of COP26. Uh, and I did mention to Prime Minister Boris, and I said there's more action that's required, an action that stems from humility and humanity. Uh, just two weeks ago, I was in, in Dubai for the MENA conference, and uh, even there, nothing much could be accomplished. So it comes down to action, and Prime Minister Modi is quite uh, posed, is quite poised rather at, uh, at action rather than words. So I think uh, the Western nations to, should uh, come down from the high horses and say, look, we messed up. We need to be more 
we need to be uh, contributors. I was with your executive director as well. He's twice my height <laughs> at the COP26, and I was talking, with, talking uh, to him as well. Action is required, which stems from humility and humanity. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't get your question. Was that a comment or a question? I see. I understand. Please, Peter. That was the one? Yeah, okay. My name is Peter Rimmele. I'm representing, I was representing the Konrad Adenauer Foundation in India. I would rather have a comment, and I start with what Mr. Sinner said. Completely right, said, we need to act, and we need to act now. So, acting costs money. So we come somewhere, if we want to act, we need the funding. So how do we get it? Uh, there are different ideas. If they're the right ones or not, maybe that's not so relevant. Uh, relevant is that you get the funding. Let me also bring this argument, why should the poor pay? Now, if a poor one causes an accident, should a rich one pay for him? Just to use that one, what is uh, the underlying issue now with any financing model, what is discussed, to have some kind of um, responsibility in it. Those who are responsible for a damage should make up for it. We could go back historically, the argument always that the industrialized countries have wasted it for 200 years and should pay the bill till the other ones have caught up. Up to that time, the, the earth will be destroyed and we will not come to a conclusion. So it's probably right to say, we cut off and look what is happening now and who is causing what. And the one who is causing damage should contribute to a sort of clean up the damage or to prevent further one. That is what I think is an underlying principle in, in, in the financing idea. And therefore, it's not a question why should the rich pay or the poor pay or whatever. The ones who are causing it should have an incentive that they don't have to pay in the future uh, by doing something now to prevent uh, it. Uh, if I look to China or if I look to India, it's polluting a lot. Europe is polluting a lot. Anyone who is doing should participate in financing that. So that's uh, rather just an opinion on that. Uh, maybe I can just uh, respond to the, to the two comments um, and maybe bring it together, uh, back together a little bit. I mean, when we talk about carbon emissions, people who are causing these carbon emissions are middle and upper classes. The poor live mostly carbon neutral lifestyles, meaning that by the nature of that, they would not have to pay very much because they're not emitting very much. So I think it is, it is a question of inequality between countries but it's also a question of inequality within countries. So also in Germany, we cannot, and we saw this now uh, with the energy prices rising for another region, um, that we cannot put this burden on uh, people who have very low incomes to pay very high fuel prices, for example. So this needs to be uh, receiving subsidies in order for them to continue their, their livelihood. So I think this type of instruments need to be regarded, but maybe um, I mean, I would like to hear from, from you also, I th what, what do you think are the avenues of cooperation? Like, where do you see the room for us to move forward? I mean, we can talk a lot about what has been done wrong in the past, and, and um, this has been done a lot, and we can probably agree on many things, but where can we move forward in the future? Justice is a very scarce commodity in this world. I don't even need to talk about what's happening in the world right now to tell you that if we are in a quest for justice, I think we'll be searching for a long time. So we have to be practical. And the way, at least in my own efforts, I've tried to be practical about it, is to say that it is in the interests of all countries to move towards net zero. So my big headline is net zero is net positive. And this is where technology, engineering, science, I think has played a miraculous role. And I say this as an engineer, uh, Ulka, I'm not an economist. <laughs> and I say this as an engineer, and I say that the good news is net zero is net positive. Green technologies are better than brown technologies. If Bangladesh wants to develop, if India wants to develop, we need to adopt green technologies. And if we do so, rather than you know the coal plants, madam, that you've shut down, 
uh, if we can move to solar, we can move to uh, hydro, we can move to tidal power, if you can move to all these renewable sources, nuclear as well, I think we can uh, avoid uh, polluting the environment more. And so we can do that uh, by getting those trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars of commercial capital pointed towards these high return opportunities. Now, there is still a very important role for government to play in terms of unleashing markets, ensuring that we have stable regulation, that the right incentives are created. All of those are very important. And then for certain technologies, yes, there has to be uh, more government investment in R&D, more subsidies, uh, more uh, you know, mandates. All of those are also required. But for 60, 70, 80% of what we need to do for net zero, Technologies are now commercially viable, and they're return-generating technologies, and so we can pursue that in our self-interest. That's the good news. The bad news is we need a lot of capital. Mm -hmm. So in India's case, as Ulkon is, knows well from the modeling work that she's done, we have to immediately start to invest $50 billion a year more in India, rising up to $100 billion by the end of this uh, decade. Now, that's on a base where today we are investing uh, you know, $100, $150 billion of corporate investments. So we have to massively increase our investments uh, in India uh, to be able to get to uh, net zero. And similarly for Bangladesh or Nigeria or Indonesia or any of the countries of the global south. So investment flows are absolutely necessary. But again, as I said, there's plenty of capital available around the world that can actually make uh, this transition and transformation happen. So again, as I said right at the outset, I said we need inclusive and comprehensive climate clubs where we create the framework for capital flows to go from the global north, which has surplus capital right now, to the global south, which is deficient in capital. And it's a win-win because, you know, we it's a, in fact a triple win because obviously uh, we improve uh, the climate, uh, you know, the global north makes money, and the global south benefits in terms of job creation and GDP growth. That's the miracle of technology, folks. That's what technology is doing for us right now. And that's, in my belief, the, 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 the approach that we have to follow. Thank you. Shirish, I wonder if I could turn to you. Sorry, you have a question. I'll just come back to you, Jujin. Um, I wonder if I could just turn to you, just to continue the thought from where Mr. Sinha left it, which is that um, in practice, in order to operationalize and have the right incentives, I believe you might be able to share one or two examples uh, on what might what we might learn from from other initiatives? I, mean, I, I completely agree with Mr. Uh, Jayan Sena that, you know, the, the, the opportunity that we have now is we need not a larger new climate club, but we need, I would not use the word climate club, but I would say I agree with, 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 with Kira when to use the word alliance, right? And a good example of alliance that exists in the world right now, which if it is well financed, can bring transformation is the International Solar Alliance. It is, it is a group, right, within the larger multilateral process that it exists. So it, 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 it is a, like a club which is there. But the only difference is that it does not exclude anyone, right? There is no exclusion principles within that. And, you know, the ambition that it has to eradicate energy poverty, access to electricity for, what, 760 million people still do not have electricity around the world. That number should scare most of the policymakers, and that's where we are failing when it comes to the SDGs implementation. So, and solar with the technology development that have happened, the improvement, the costs coming down, and also storage technologies making rapid improvement, it is already the most cheapest form of electricity. Maybe not yet in Africa because it's still expensive there, and that's what our analysis so shows. But in South Asia, in Asia, it is now becoming the most cheapest option. So I think if we look at specific alliances which can actually bring transformation, um, we have something which exists, which we, if we, it has a huge ambition of, let's say, um, by 2026, it's want to mobilize a billion dollar, right? Now, billion dollar in the world is available. We, we can actually uh, make that resource available, but I think that's what uh, needs to be made available for ISA to achieve its vision that it basically has. Now, the other idea which is more, which is being discussed, and there are several such alliances ideas being discussed. I believe as part of the 
the G7 proposal that Germany is put forward and the, within Europe, the conversation is on something around a green hydrogen alliance, right? And that's being discussed currently. There's also a conversation happening around energy efficiency and energy standards, simplifying that as part of it. In the opening remarks, Mr. Jayant Sinha made about the temperature that we are currently in, right? South Asia is going through a heat wave. Last year was a warning and we did not heat to it. This year has been extreme. We are still in the month of April. We are ex seeing extreme heat wave conditions. And this is happening all over the world. Yet our effort and concerted effort towards finding low cost, low GWP cooling solutions has not been, has got the inadequate attention. And if you can form an alliance around that, so you can simplify technology, you can bring down, uh, the global cooling price did that in terms of incentivizing. And again, India played a critical role there. But I think if you look at such initiatives within the larger umbrella, we might get more traction because this that will benefit everyone, right? It is it's the poor and low uh, middle income households who demand cooling for demand for cooling will grow in the coming years are looking for solutions. India's own estimation under the India Cooling Action Plan, cooling demand will grow by 8x, right? Uh, in next 15 years. It's, it's going to grow by that volume, number of x in most of the part of the world. So therefore, finding solutions which are easier, and it has a huge climate benefit altogether. So I think those are the kind of specific areas that what as solutions we need to m make which could then become part of the discourse that happens whether the G7 or the G20 to take it forward. Thanks. Jujin, would you like to ask your question? Um, no, uh, um, I also was a person who was like, carbon tax, yeah. <laughs> carbon tax, um, carbon tax, carbon pricing, I would say more, more, more broadly, emissions trading included, um, um, is, I would say, assumes a very perfect person. That might be um, one of the problems. People like free stuff. Who wants to have a tax slip coming in from the IRS um, in your house? Nobody likes that, even though you're receiving service. Everybody likes free stuff. People are very intuitive, and that's why iPhones are good. Um, and, uh, and another thing is that everybody likes green. So a lot of financial institutions say they want to go to, go to Bangladesh for green projects, but what happens in Bangladesh is that you've got an awesome, awesome power purchase agreement scheme for fossil fuel projects, coal power projects, but you go to renewables, you've got a lot of uncertainties. You don't know when you're going to be curtailed. You, you, the, the, the system operator is, is there, f associated deeply with the coal power plant operators. It's very local. I mean, th there are very local things that have to change. So, um, and, and, and carbon, if a carbon tax happens, it, it's going to get mixed up with those local situations. Um, 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 I'm kind of, uh, and so I think, I mean, I think those kind of two things should be considered a little bit. I mean, people like green stuff in general. They want to send money into green stuff, but what happens uh, is, is not the reality. And then people like simple stuff. But the, the other point I want to mention is that, um, is that power which is a, going to be a driver of the low carbon economy, is a very local product. It doesn't usually go over the borders. It's not, power companies don't trade power with, with India doesn't trade power with Korea, but India does trade power, steel with Korea. It's a global product, so the pressure points are different. And therefore, there's a lot more consumer pressure that, that can go into more global products like steel. And I think for that reason, CBAM could be one of these solutions for the steel sector, but also the globe, everybody like, the fact that everybody likes green. I'm willing to pay 20 more dollars for a refrigerator built with green steel. Could be the winning thing, more intuitive winning thing for, 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 for the industrial sector emissions. Thank you. Thanks, and I think that really helps to clarify that we are talking about this instrument at three scales. We're talking about it at the country scale, whether it could be potentially a flow of funds from the global north to the global south. We're talking about it at an industry scale, sort of almost cutting across borders, flowing where the trade flows go. And then we're talking about it at a very individual scale, where we want to make sure that it's not regressive, but also that it influences 
personal choices behavior. And I also refer to the lifestyle uh, issue that was brought out by India at Glasgow. Uh, but we have a couple of moments for more questions from the audience. And then, Elizabeth, I'll come to you as well for some examples. But yes, please, go ahead. Maybe we'll go to you first, sir, because you have not had a chance to speak before. And yeah. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Pragyan Agarwal. I work with the government and assist them in international trade negotiations. Uh, I would like to uh, continue what uh, Mr. Mr. Sinha said, uh, the, the issue of technology. I think it's it's a very important issue. And I think uh, access to finance is not just one thing which is going to solve climate. Access to technology is, I think, more important than access to finance. So, sir, uh, do you think that... Uh, uh, when we are uh, when we are sort of taking international commitments in terms of climate change, uh, countries will agree to share these green technologies because that's where the catch is. I mean, uh, we we and I would like I would like Kira to also comment on this. Like, will EU be able to, you know, um, make concessions in terms of their intellectual property rights on on the products? Uh, I mean, on on green products because ultimately. Even if you provide finance to LDCs or the, the developing countries, how do they manufacture it until they have technology? I mean, countries like India, they, they, they have technology. But say, for example, country like Bangladesh, they need collaborative efforts with, with these EU companies who, who transfer technology to, to local companies in Bangladesh. Because ultimately, if we put a tax and we just import finished products from these countries, I mean, it will end up in an economic colonialism kind of a situation situation. So I think uh, technology transfer is a very important issue, which has not been looked upon um, very seriously. Uh, so yeah, your views, sir, and also also Kira, yeah, on this. No, there's been a lot of discussion on technology transfer. In fact, it was uh, a very serious subject for discussion uh, in Glasgow and through all of the COPs. And the reality, of course, is that technology is being transferred, whether you talk about India or Bangladesh. Uh, Bangladesh has a lot of natural gas turbines. Those turbines are being built by Siemens or Alcatel or GE. For example, uh, if you look at the solar panels we have in India, many of those are being imported. Uh, the technology for solar panels was developed in the US and then further commercialized in China. Uh, if you look at our wind turbines, a lot of our wind turbines have been licensed from Danish and Spanish wind turbine manufacturers. Our nuclear technology is all imported. So I wouldn't say that technology is not being transferred. Technology is being transferred very, very quickly uh, and being adapted and commercialized in India and equally true in Bangladesh. Yeah, I think the, the question of intellectual property rights uh, you raised is, uh, is an important one. I mean, it's a, tricky, it's a tricky one and we're seeing this with the vaccines now. I think for some key technologies, um, one option would be for governments um, to buy copyrights on certain key technologies for them to be used in the public. Because you cannot just take these rights from companies who have invested into uh, building them. But one, one option, and this is actually what happened with um, the prior model of the camera, of what is now a modern camera, is that it was uh, released the, um, the copyright on uh, the first version of, of what is now a camera, and then it was taken to the next, next level. So I think maybe this is one thing uh, that could be done. I agree, there's a lot of technology uh, transferred, um, but I think what, what has worked is also um, building capacities, for example, through vocational training. This is something that, that Germany is doing. Um, is to train people um, in various um, vocations and various jobs um, because often what happens uh, if you just um, give technology without having people who can operate it and who can make parts to replace them is that they, they just break at some point and then they can no longer be used and then it's kind of a stranded asset. So I think it's, um, it's a hot topic. But there's many pitfalls that you have to look at when, um, when committing to a certain type of technology transfer. I just realized I didn't introduce myself. I am, <laughs> I am Arpata from uh, Bangalore. And some of the Indians may know that Bangalore was a cool city. And it's no longer a cool city. We are suffering heat waves. Um, so I have two questions. Maybe there is no right answer to this. But um, 
one should it fall on individuals or the consumers at all because most people are trying to get by day to day and if a hamburger is the most accessible and the cheapest food that they can get their hands on then they will eat it so should it fall on the individuals at all uh the second question is what would it take to make climate crisis as serious as covid-19 or any other similar diseases or issues thank you uh, may i request elizabeth maybe to answer the question about food and you know bring in some of the other things that you're passionate about as well and madam maybe you could have the last word on what it would take to make it a serious crisis thank you for not asking me the next one but i i <laughs> i agree with what, <laughs> what my neighbor said and 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 covid um pales i i mean i hate to say that just given the laws, lives lost but it pales uh, in comparison to climate and you know the reality is if we don't address climate we will have covid 20 fill in the blank before before we know it um you know i'm, I'm glad you brought up the food uh the food discussion i think i said that earlier today as well because you know with, with india um and its economy with i think 40 plus percent of employment is driven by the agriculture um agricultural like a part of the economy and it also is about represents about what 20 25 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions i know our conversations focus very much on energy but i think there's a real opportunity here as well um, to take a look at agriculture to think about how um, we might be able to look at what you know we call it the foundation good food for people and good food for the planet uh, because there is so much opportunity around regenerative agriculture and really in thinking about how we can use um, it as a carbon sink, as a way to be able to create better nutritional outcomes, especially in, in this country and in so many others where stunting is a reality um, of, of, for, so many, for so many children. And so um, I, I know that that's not where we're hide, heading in this conversation, but I, I do want to raise that as, as a way to think about um, a, a carbon and how we might be able to provide another s solution there. Um, I also do just, I also, uh, you know, we talk about carbon tax. I, I think to your point, you know, we're, we're very focused on figuring out how to end poverty um, and really create economic opportunity for all. And the thing that I was very much struck by, and I think Sharish just kind of goes to your point, was the work that, you know, has been done around electrification for rural communities and um, the opportunity to really improve people's incomes and household incomes by 20 to 30 percent just by the ability to have uh, clean and clean renewable power so um, you know as we think about carbon tax um, I, I also do think we have to think about economic opportunity and uplift and, and not forget that at the core of what we're trying to, to do is to make sure that people have access to opportunity and are able to meet their basic needs and, and live live a wholesome and fulfilling life Last. Thank you, Ulka. Very uh, interesting conversation from all sides, and uh, there's a lot. There's much to think, but there is not much time to think. We have to act, and uh, you know, Bangladesh. We are. Uh, we have. We're going to implement this climate prosperity plan, Mujib Climate Prosperity Plan, and. Uh, it, 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 it will focus on green growth, resilient infrastructure, uh, renewable energy, all these things. But, you know, we are, that also requires finances. And all the talk about technology transfer, see, the vaccines, we are still fighting to have the vaccine patents and to have them, uh, like, Many, many, many people around the world have not yet been, yet been vaccinated. And uh, we couldn't decide, it, no decision has been made about, you know, sharing the uh, technology of making vaccines. And climate issue is very, very serious. And, there are finances available that we hear, and maybe all conditions, we should think about those conditions that finances depend upon. And it could be not, not all conditions can be met. There are always a lot, we have seen that these finances come with a lot of conditions. 
And we, if we have to act quickly, we have to make it very simple, that we must have access to funds to ensure that, you know, uh, that climate vulnerable countries have fair access to technology, uh, climate friendly technology, and also have access to funds so that we can act quickly. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we'll, I'm so sorry, we're really out of time. Uh, but I really want to thank my fellow panelists. I'm really overwhelmed at the amount of resources you have at your disposal, whether it is political capital, philanthropic resources, intellectual human capital. I mean, you could change the world between you, <laughs> yes? And really warm thanks to all the participants. Please do keep in touch with us. As you've heard, this is a proposal that we would like to develop further. Uh, please do share your thoughts with us. And safe travels back home. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank Good night. You.